Uh, but good afternoon. Welcome back for lunch, from lunch. Uh, my name is Tasha Hutta. I am a BLM cadastral surveyor. I'm also the CFEDS program manager uh, and probably a couple other titles in there. But if you put too many up there, then you start to lose. Oh, I need to be louder. Thank you for the feedback. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so today's topic uh, is the CFEDS, the bills, and cadastral resources in the fiduciary trust model. Uh, and I'm excited to present this. I've never presented this topic before, so um, feel free to ask questions for some bits of information I may have missed because I, it's just my first time presenting it. So the federal role in the fiduciary trust model is to influence and raise the quality of surveying uh, cadastral services provided to federal agencies, including Indian lands. Uh, today's learning goals are simple, simply to walk out for you guys to walk out of the session knowing the cadastral resources that are available to you. Uh, and when I say cadastral, does every, does, does anybody kind of shake their heads and say, like, I hear that word, but I don't know what it means? Yeah, I'm a cadastral surveyor, and I can kind of say that, too. I'm, um, because uh, So the word cadastral comes from the Greek word cadastri, uh, and the true definition is really about um, surveying of land for taxation. Uh, the way I use the term cadastral is the survey of federal interest lands. Uh, really, any kind of surveys that are large enough that you have to take geodetics into account, the curvature of the earth. Uh, and so, cadastral surveys are the specialty of the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, some other things, we're gonna be talking about the special needs of Indian land surveys, discussing the roles uh, that cadastral plays and the tools and resources that are available to you, as well as some non-survey types of products that are available to you as well. Um, and also the benefits of using the CFEDS, our Certified Federal Surveyor Training Program. So during our time together, we're gonna to be discussing the CFEDS, the bills, the cadastral resources, as well as a few types of those surveys and related documents associated with fee-to-trust transactions. The reference material that I'll be using for this presentation uh, all of these materials are available pretty easily with a Google search. Um, if anyone needs help locating them, I'll be happy to help you with that. Uh, but our BLM Manual of Surveying Instruction, uh, our CFEDS Program Handbook, and 303DM7, a lot of the non-survey products that I'll be talking about today come directly from our 303DM7, which is our standards for Indian Trust Lands Boundary Evidence. Is everyone in here familiar with, with that? remotely familiar at least. I see some nodding heads. Uh, as well as the current uh, policy memo uh, that's at the bottom there. I feel if I try to pronounce it, I'll mess it up. Uh, but we'll also be discussing the current policy memo uh, in place too when it comes to fee to trust transactions. So what are the special needs of tribal land surveys? Um, and we've got a mic set up in the middle here. I'm hoping that uh, hopefully we'll get some questions or some interaction as well. But I'm curious from you guys in the audience, what are some special needs uh, for Indian land surveys? <laughs> Do you mind coming up to the mic and sharing? Or? Me? Oh, I thought I saw your hand raise. I did for a second and then I'm like, I don't want to talk on the mic. Um, federal trust pass. Federal trust assets, is that what I heard you say? Trespass. Oh, trespass. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, anything else come to anybody's mind? <laughs> um, I, I had a situation where um, a father left his three kids descriptive um, wasn't really surveyed out, but he had meets and bounds on him on his uh, native allotment, and so there was, you know, disputes going on about whose land was whose, and he had it really detailed on a map on the native allotment um, map. So it it went to probate, and the judge accepted it in the probate, but then it later became an issue with the kids. So I was able to get it cadastral surveyed. Oh, 
excellent. With that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that I think is definitely a unique need uh, when it comes to uh, Indian land surveys. Those the um, passing it down to the kids and uh, you know those deeds. Uh, I totally understand that. Uh, one thing that I think is really important about surveys of tribal land is chasing that chain of title back to the original owner, chasing it all the way back. And really, the, the concept behind chasing it back is making sure that the full bundle of rights is transferred. Um, we, we use this terminology called you know, the, the bundle of sticks. Um, and so whenever we transfer properties or, or we do a transaction like that, there's a whole bundle. You know, one, of those, one of those sticks is the survey. Uh, you know, another stick is, is title. Um, there's a whole bunch of sticks in there. And we want to make sure that when the land transfers, that they transfer with all of the sticks that are associated with that. And helping to do that is chasing it all the way back uh, to its original owner. Surveying is very different than just putting a legal description on the ground, uh, kind of like was just noted here. You know, we can write out a legal description on paper. Um, but when it comes to putting it on the ground, that is a whole different <laughs> type of scenario. Um, so surveying is very different than just putting that legal description on the ground. Um, encroachment, trespass, easements, making sure that all of those items have been addressed, um, making sure that the value of the land uh, stays intact and it's not impaired during that transfer by any of those trespasses or those encroachments. Um, and as a surveyor, if any of you attended uh, my session yesterday, I used the same analogy of a puzzle. I love puzzles. I love to put puzzles together, but they only work if you have all of the pieces. Uh, and so that, to me, is part of surveying and part of doing tribal land surveys is making sure that you have all of the pieces of that puzzle to be able to put it together and see that full picture. Uh, roles of cadastral survey, so specific uh, federal, federal kind of interest programs here. Cadastral survey plays two roles that I'm going to discuss today. The first one is our bills, our BLM Indian land surveyors, and then also our CFEDs, our certified federal surveyors. Our bills surveyors, we'll discuss them first. Uh, we have a BLM Indian land surveyor located in each BIA regional office. Uh, they are BLM surveyors who are located in those offices to help with anything survey related um, and also help with any land questions, anything related to that uh, that can come up. One thing that's really important for you to know is that tribes can contact bills independently of BIA. You don't have to go through BIA to be able to talk to your bill surveyor. You can contact them directly. Uh, if you're unsure if you need to hire a surveyor for a project, then a bills can offer quick advice uh, and points and, and point out some possible options, uh, help you find some surveyors as well uh, to help if that is something that you're looking for. You have the whole resources of BLM cadastral survey, surveys at your fingertips through your bills surveyors. Uh, how do you contact your bills? Do you guys know how to contact your bills? I see mostly shaking heads, nodding heads, yes, excellent. That is wonderful to hear, <laughs> wonderful to see. Um, if any of you are sitting out there and you're not sure how to contact your bills, uh, on our cfeds.org website, we have a, a pull-down list that offers a direct form for you to uh, send an email directly to the bills. So you don't, you don't even have to know their name. You just go to the CFEDS website and be able to do a pull-down, and it will send an email directly to them. And now our Certified Federal Surveyor Program. I want to tell you a little bit about this as well. So the CFEDS program was launched in 2006 with the intent to train state registered professional land surveyors to perform land boundary surveys up to federal standards. Um, that was really the key there. A lot of surveyors were, surveys were being performed uh, by private survey, surveyors, and uh, there's, there's state standards and then there's federal standards. And when it came to doing transactions of surveys that were going to be recorded with BIA, uh, the, uh, a certain standard of care needed to be increased. Um, and there was an opportunity to educate our uh, professional surveyors 
and the, working in the private sector. So the CFEDS program, Certified Federal Surveyor Training Program, was developed. Uh, the initial goal was to train surveyors to do surveys for Indian country. However, that training really has evolved in the past 17 years, and it is now known as the premier training program for all of the public land survey system. Uh, I guess you guys can read those bullets up there, but a, a few highlights I'll point out to you. Um, the CFEDS program goal is to provide consistent, timely, efficient, and economical assessment for the boundary evidence relative to the Indian trust assets. Um, protect and preserve those Indian trust assets from boundary conflicts, trespass, unauthorized use, and ambiguous, in, and ambiguous land descriptions. So some of the things for the CFEDS training program, the surveyor must all, already be registered, a licensed registered surveyor in the state that they are working in. Uh, and they can't have any disciplinary actions against them within the past five years. Uh, so if they meet those requirements, then they can apply for the training program. Um, and I've got another slide that shows a little bit more about what sort of training that they receive. But do you need to use a CFED surveyor for the projects if you have a, a, a project needing survey? Do you need to use a CFED? I see. I see a couple heads nodding yes, and thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, it's not required. You're not required by any means to use a CFED surveyor. However, we certainly do recommend it uh, because of that specialized training that they receive. So if you have a surveyor that you're already working with and they're not a CFED surveyor, then it may benefit both you and that surveyor to make them aware of the CFEDS program and have them become a CFEDS. Whoops. That went way too quick. There we go. Here's the slide I'm supposed to be on. Uh, so a little bit about the training uh, that those surveyors have to go through. It's a specialized training. It's available in the self-study virtual courses in seven different modules, followed by a three-part final exam. It is, uh, it takes, uh, there's two years. Once somebody signs up, then they have two years in order to complete the training, and they have three attempts to be able to complete the exams. Um, and that unit two exam is a little bit difficult to get through. That's the one that has all of the computations, all of the math. It takes, uh, it takes surveyors normally a couple of times to pass that one. Um, so it's definitely a thorough training program. Um, And an important thing to note about the CFEDS program is that it is not a licensure program. It is just a certificate program. Um, it's intended to add additional credentials onto a professional license already. Uh, so surveyors, if you're working with a surveyor, they have to be licensed in the state that they're performing work in. Um, that, that's priority number one. The CFEDS does not override. <laughs> Um, so if they're trying to, if they are licensed in Idaho and they're trying to do work in Washington with a CFED certificate, that's not how the system works. They have to be registered uh, to perform work in Washington also. Uh, who does the CFEDS program benefit? Uh, as the CFEDS program manager, I've been doing a lot of conferences this year uh, for surveyors to going out and doing continuing education programs uh, for our registered CFEDS. Uh, so it definitely benefits the surveyor. They get a continuous education. The program itself has a continuing education requirement, so we know that they're staying up to date on standards uh, and that they are apprised of any new developments, any new policies that come out, which we've had one recently that we'll discuss. Um, it definitely benefits the client. Um, so if you're doing work and you have a CFEDS surveyor, then they are going to understand uh, the resources that they have available to them to do all of the research that they need to do, to, change, to um, do all the research back to the original owner uh, that we were talking about earlier on. How many of you in here have worked with a CFEDS surveyor? Good experience, poor experience, anyone willing to share their experience? <laughs> That's okay. It's after lunch. <laughs> uh, 
so how do you find a CFEDS? We have, um, I don't know if the 566 is active, actually, I'm gonna click this link here. Um, the way you find a CFEDS surveyor in your area, go into the uh, CFEDS.org website. There is a link in there, I think it's under um, information, how to find a CFEDS or find a CFEDS. Uh, and when you do that, you'll get this document that pops up. Whoops, that's not the one I wanted. And it will give you an overview of how many CFEDS there are by certain states. And we currently have 523. Um, there we go. Now it's up there on the screen. Thank you for that. Uh, so we have 523 CFEDS that are, uh, have chosen for their information to be provided uh, publicly on the website. So once you go there, then it, right now, it is only available in this alphabetical list that is 63 pages long. Uh, so there's a lot of surveyors out there available to you guys to reach out and call. And you can see that uh, there are some surveyors that are registered in multiple states as well. So that gives a lot of flexibility for, um, for some work that you guys might need to be doing. In the future, we're working to develop an interactive map uh, that helps with uh, locating that CFEDS uh, information a lot quicker so that you don't have to go wade through that entire spreadsheet. Um, the developers, the, the website developers have been working on that recently. Uh, we also have 65 students that are currently enrolled in the training program right now that are uh, somewhere between just registered and uh, looking to complete their final exams as well. So. Um, the program has been getting a lot more attention recently with our new website release, uh, and we're getting a lot more interest in the program again. Uh, I'm gonna switch topics a little bit and talk about a current policy memo uh, that is out and how it affects uh, working with cadastral, uh, working with surveyors uh, within the federal government or within the CFEDS program. Uh, I do want to caveat this by saying I am not a BIA employee, so I'm gonna be very careful not to overstep. Uh, my goal is purely just to be informational. And the way I like to describe this policy is that there was a problem to solve. The problem was that fee to trust transactions in some regions were taking, uh, it was reported in some regions taking up to 300 days or in excess of 300 days. And not all regions were, were that uh, big of a number, However, all we need is one region to, to be a big number for it to be a problem at all. Uh, so the problem was is that fee to trust transactions were taking an excessively amount of, of time and a problem like that needs a solution. So this policy uh, memo was released to solve that problem. The intent of the policy is to reduce the number of days to complete that fee to trust transaction. And one way to speed that process is to address that length of time in completing that land description review. Uh, under 303 DM7, that uh, Department of Manual that I mentioned at the very beginning that um, a good portion of you said that you were familiar with. So under 303 DM7, uh, that policy, temporary memo aside, the policy requires a land description review uh, approved by the Chief Cadastral Surveyor. Um, and that was taking some time. So under the temporary policy intent, the requirement of having a land description review has been removed. Uh, and in its place, there have been added, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna mess up, I've got them on the screen here and I'm still probably gonna mess them up. The RLDR, the Realty Land Description Review, or an LDEV, a land description examination and verification. Uh, so in place uh, with the uh, L LDR, the land description review not being required, these two additional products were added in their place. And the policy, the temporary policy, also adds uh, processes and time frames intended to reduce that overall amount of days to process a transaction. Having a complete package is very key to completing that process and getting it done in a timely manner. So once all of those required documents are submitted, that Realty Land Description Review, that RLDR, 
Uh, once all of those documents are submitted, then that RLDR must be completed within 30 days. Uh, this applies to all simple land descriptions. So what happens when it's not simple? How many of you have simple land descriptions? I, yeah, I don't, I, <laughs> I don't know when the last time I saw a simple land description was. Um, so when a land description is determined to not be simple or to be complex, then all of those documents are compiled and submitted to the GIS strike team, who has 30 days to complete and return that package. And what happens if it's returned incomplete? Uh, we don't always get it right the first time, so if it is returned incomplete, then the requester has three days to respond to that incomplete case. And I mentioned uh, that they were submitted to the GIS strike team, so what about the strike team? So the strike team currently has three members uh, for all 12 regions. Uh, the members are not surveyors. I don't say that in a disparaging way. I say it just as an acknowledgement because I know I'm a surveyor myself and I know uh, what gets looked at during those land description reviews. So the GIS strike team is responsible for examining the validity of land descriptions, including acreage, the validation and review are intended to verify that the description is accurate, correctly describes the subject property, and that it is consistent throughout the acquisition documents, uh, such as commitment for title insurance, surveys, or any other related maps, deeds, and etc. So how does that policy affect any of you wanting to use CFEDS to do any of your survey work? The short answer is that it's different in the different regions. The policy uh, is being interpreted differently in different regions. My answer, is, and some in the room may disagree, my answer is that the, that the current policy does not prevent the use of CFEDS. Uh, even though that land description review is no longer required, the CFEDs are still very, very valuable in the process, and I still encourage you to engage with them on any of the projects uh, that you might need their expertise and their specialized experience for. I ran through that piece really quick. I'm running through this whole presentation really quick. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, let's talk about some uh, types of surveys and some uh, non-survey product, products that are available and as, as tools for you. The first one is a federal authority survey. So a federal authority survey, that is what you uh, may be familiar with, the original records from the GLO, those uh, cadastral surveys, or surveys from the BLM. So a federal authority survey is a decision by the US government it's considered the gold standard of surveys. A federal survey is both the plat of that survey and the field notes attached. They're considered one single document. Uh, and I know that many people, when they're doing records research, they'll just uh, get a copy of the plat, even just a digital copy, and have that in their records to reference. If you are doing any records research and you are downloading a survey plat, I highly recommend that you make it a part of your practice to include getting those field notes along with it because the document, um, the record itself is only a complete record if it has both the field notes and the associated survey plat. Uh, the next type of survey we'll talk about is a state authority survey. So a state authority survey is an opinion of a licensed professional private surveyor. Um, they have training, they have special expertise, uh, but it is uh, of a different authority than the federal authority. The one I don't have up here is what we refer to as a no authority survey. So we have federal authority, state authority, and this third category, which does not fit the other two, we call it a no authority survey. Uh, and these are surveys that are not recovered. They're often not even discovered until you're doing a field investigation and you find some monuments in the ground that were not expected. Uh, 
the surveys and those monuments that are associated with them should not be re relied upon to the same degree as you do uh, with a, a state authority survey or a federal authority survey until you can find some cooperating evidence associated with them. Uh, so we've talked about the types of survey products that are available to you. Uh, surveys are wonderful things, but we also know that they're not appropriate for everything that we're trying to accomplish, and they're often kind of expensive. Um, and so depending on what your budgets are, you might be looking for another alternative than going out and doing a full-blown survey on the ground. So 303DM7 offers you some additional tools and resources, and we're going to dive into what those are. Uh, those are the land description review certificate, the chain of surveys, the certificate of inspection and possession, and the boundary assurance certificate. The primary purpose of these certificates is to document and formalize the collection and analysis of boundary evidence for Indian land conveyances. So when it comes to standards for boundary evidence, that's what we call those group of four uh, certificates that I just discussed. We call those our standards of boundary evidence. Uh, for these, we're not really talking about doing those on the ground surveys. We're talking about a surveyor using their expertise, their knowledge of that situation to gather information, to analyze that information, and then to report back to a manager, to an owner, uh, to the client, about those boundaries so that those owners, those clients, those managers, they can make good judgments about what needs to be done for the projects that, that are at hand. The standards, those four certificate types that I talked about, these are uh, decision assisting tools, processes for land managers and trust beneficiaries. They do not replace a federal authority survey. They purely uh, supplement and offer a non-survey type product uh, that are available. And it's just a really good method to document, formalize, gather, review all of the boundary evidence. So the first one of those we're gonna talk about is a land description review. Uh, so a land description review, the purpose of it is to identify the size and location of a parcel uh, determined by its physical boundaries. Uh, in general, for all of the portion of that parcel to be conveyed, a written description identifying the physical boundaries is required. When we're doing any sort of land transactions, uh, the, an old uh, principle that we fall upon comes from the Act of 1785, but even before that, it's built upon English law called the Statute of Frauds, uh, which is that when we're doing land transactions, it's required for them to be in writing regardless of value, uh, which is why we have uh, the deeds and the transfers and stuff that, that have become commonplace. Uh, So a land description review is, uh, it evaluates that that written description provided is free of error, free of conflict or ambiguity, and can withstand legal challenge uh, and fulfills the intent of that land description. That sounds like such a good thing. Wouldn't, don't we all want land descriptions uh, that we can, with the best of our ability, make them free of error, free of conflict, um, reduce that ambiguity? So a land description review seeks to assure that that intent is realized. Uh, we make sure to look at that description uh, and, uh, and that com complete, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here and they're messing me up more than they're helping me. <laughs> So when a surveyor prepares a land description review, the response that you'll receive uh, is a standard form and it indicates the perceived risk. A low risk for a land description is acceptable as, as it's written, uh, as it's presented with all the attached documentation. 
A medium risk for a land description has potential problems associated with it. However, the risk is kind of minor and the risk might not affect the type of action um, that, is, that is being proposed or that activity. So um, it may have an error with it, but because it, um, if the action being done is a lease, then that error might be relatively low for the intent of what it was gonna be used for. If we were doing a conveyance with that same type of land description, that risk might be a higher, um, for, depending on the intent of what is being done. A high risk for a land description is one that has potential problems and should not be used as written uh, for that conveyance or for that activity. All errors and any concerns are noted by the surveyor whenever, they, uh, whenever you receive that land description review. Uh, it's noted it's a standard form that tells you the risk and there's a space in there for the surveyor to let you know any, uh, identify specifically what are the items that need attention. If it is a medium risk or a high risk, it does not, it's not a showstopper. If you receive one that is high risk, uh, it doesn't stop the process at all. All it is doing is telling that manager, that resource person, um, the decision maker, that there are problems that are associated with that description that need to be addressed. Uh, sometimes those problems can be really minor and get taken care of, and sometimes they can be major. But really it's giving the decision makers all of the information that they need to be able to decide how they want to go forward. Uh, the next uh, type of product that is available is the, the chain of surveys. The chain of surveys is a collection of successive land surveys or other forms of boundary or corner identification. Uh, it goes back to uh, the government, the original land conveyance, uh, the original patent from the government. Uh, the primary purpose of the certificate is to compile all the records of all the survey documents related to the area of the conveyance. Um, and to develop an opinion based upon the analysis of all of those survey documents. So it's not all the survey plats that we find uh, when we're looking at a chain of surveys. We're also identifying any corner descriptions. Uh, anytime someone has visited that corner, anytime a landowner has given information about that corner, and perhaps maybe we receive affidavits from that landowner with additional information. Uh, sometimes it may be adjoining deeds. There may be a, information tied to a corner from another surveyor or for another adjoining deed. Uh, so anything that attaches to those, uh, those boundary lines, the corners associated with them, or those surveys, all of those things are looked at, evaluated, and discovered during the chain of survey certificate process. The next one to discuss here is the Certificate of Inspection and Possession. And this is when we go out there on the ground. Uh, we go out there, we make site visits. It's based on the physical inspection of that property, uh, looking for possible defects, conflicts, ambiguity, adverse claims, um, uh, adverse claims by anybody claiming that they have use or occupancy of that property. All right. A certificate of inspection and possession is still an opinion. All of these documents that I've talked about are still a, opinions based upon the expertise and the specialized experience of the surveyor who is, who is creating these documents. Uh, they report on the condition of the corners, the monuments, and the boundaries out there. Um, and because we're doing a field investigation, we certainly make attempts to identify any unauthorized use or occupancy uh, some of those are very hard to find until you're actually on the ground. Um, so we'll note uh, buildings, we'll note, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, we've seen <laughs> the ones I'm familiar with, I'm thinking of, you know, abandoned boat trailers or uh, features that are identified on the property. We don't necessarily assign any ownership to those where we identify the location and that they are existing whenever that field visit is conducted. 
And the last of these four products is the Boundary Assurance Certificate. Uh, the Boundary Assurance Certificate is an opinion by the Chief Cadastral Surveyor as to the risk uh, associated with the intended use of that, of that land uh, based upon all of those products that I talked about. Um, boundary use certificate or boundary assurance certificates uh, are actually pretty rare. I've only seen a couple of them completed. Normally, in the process, if we get to the point where a boundary boundary assurance certificate is um, is wanted, then there no has normally been some sort of extenuating factor that has uh, that has launched a, an actual survey to be done. Um, but boundary assurance certificates are a nail, another option as well. So again, it is just compiled from all of the information from the land description review, the chain of survey, the certificate of inspection and possession, and uh, all of those to identify any known boundary defects, conflicts, or ambiguities, uh, gaps, overlaps, unwritten laws, et cetera, et cetera. It is not an official survey. It's an opinion to the risk associated with the current or intended use of that land. And I tell you what, I planned on way more interaction. <laughs> I, think, I think that might be a record presentation for me. <laughs> um, that is the end of my slide materials. Um, I went through a lot of information there. Does anyone have any questions? I'll put it on the next slide, actually, and then I can come down and walk around. It tends to get quiet after lunch. Everyone's kind of settling down. Yes? We want to request a survey. Um, how do we, is there a form, a form for payment? So the question is how do we request a survey? Uh, it depends on, so are you, so uh, you can request through BIA. So I work with BIA. Okay, so you work with BIA. Uh, Chris, do you, Chris used to be a Bills, and Chris works with this. Can, that's okay, I'll pull you in. What was the question? The question is, uh, how does, how does a, a person working at BIA go to request a survey from BLM? I'm going to give you the mic. So are, are we talking about an official survey? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that you will need is to make sure that you fully understand why you need the survey and what you expect out of it. And then you will need to reach out to the cadastral survey staff and fill out the 9600-1 form, 9600 form. So if it's for a tribe, I think tribes requested it because there's a dispute on the boundary. Okay. So it's probably get that information from the tribe. Yes. The, the 9600 form, and then there's going to have to be funding because we don't work for free, yeah. unfortunately, and work with them on that one. And, and make sure you have the conversation with it because a lot of times when people fill out the forms or do <clears throat> whatever, they may not fully understand what they need, and you may not need a fully blown cadastral survey. One of these others, the Boundary Assurance Certificate, could be the answer for that. So if you sit down and have the conversation with him, so Andrew, I'm gonna call you out, is that okay? So he's a surveyor and we go, hey, I have a boundary issue, so we need to discuss this. And he's okay, so I bring him all the information I get and he looks at it and says, hey, we may, those corners may be out there, we can go out there and look for them and do a boundary, uh, a certificate of inspection and possession and say yes, it is that, and then take that to BIA, or no, we can't find any of the corners, we're going to have to do a full-blown survey, and it doesn't need to be a federal authority survey or a state authority survey. So, and, and just, you know, Tasha and I have this conversation all the time, the same thing. It's a relationship, being able to talk to the individual 
And if you don't understand what they're saying to you, ask the questions. Because, you know, we all use different languages, different dictionaries, and they could be saying something and you totally misunderstand what they're saying. And so. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, I would offer, uh, in addition to what Chris said, is uh, using your bills as a contact as well. Um, yeah, so the, the bills, uh, they're, you know, a, a survey resource available to you. Uh, so you can reach out to them with your question, and they can help with initial all of those initial questions. They can also help you fill out that survey request form, that 9600 form that we that we talked about, and they can provide it for you and help you make the maps, help you identify the boundaries, um, ask the questions so that whenever you can gather all of the correct documents, so that you can submit a full package. So whenever you guys do do a full-blown LDR review, do you want the as acquired on the survey with the True North? Because we kind of go back and forth because sometimes the as acquired is what they used, the previous person used to buy it, and we know that there's errors in that. Yeah. So we kind of struggle with, do we want to put that on there when we know that the calls are off? But we do have a True North, so sometimes they'll say as acquired, and then here's the you know True North. Yeah. How do you guys prefer? When you're doing your I would say, um, so the question is uh, it, it, to do a land description review and you're submitting a package for a surveyor to complete that land description review, um, can you use the as acquired document? Uh, so I, I have two answers to that. The first one is, um, is find a surveyor, I, this is for everybody, find, find a surveyor that you like working with um, build a good relationship with them, get them in your back pocket so that they um, are a good resource. Um, they'll answer the phone. They're, they're probably a little bit busy themselves as everyone else is in here, but they'll return your calls. You know that you can trust their answers. Um, so the first one is just build a relationship with the surveyor because that person you'll get to understand. You'll be able to shoot that message. Hey, I've got this document. Is that okay? The second response to that is just a general. Not knowing the details of the project, not knowing who you're gonna be work with in general, extra information is never a bad thing. You can give all of the information that you have available to you and then they can decide if they're going to use it or not or they can ask for some additional information. Um, but providing that is way better than not providing it. Um, yeah, and the surveyors will know how to use, they'll know how to read it, they'll understand its value and how to incorporate that with all of the other documents that they're evaluating. Yeah. Hello, I'm Andy Orozco. I'm a, a licensed land surveyor for the state of California. I was a, a, a CFEDS surveyor also. In fact, I was in the beta group, which means I was in the first group that was certified uh, in the uh, in the bills uh, program or in the CFED program. Uh, I currently work for uh, Morongo Band of uh, Mission Indians. I am their surveyor for their realty department. And uh, what we do is we offer surveying for all of the local reservations uh, so, that, uh, so that we can help them in their needs uh, since we offer a full realty, uh, you know, a full realty uh, product. What is very, what is very important uh, is that the surveyor not only have a, have a relationship uh, with the bills. Uh, in fact, I just finished texting uh, uh, Ellen, our bills, you know, de dealing with uh, some issues, but also with the tribe uh, because you know, when you go, when you're, you're, you're working with a tribe, you're, you're working with a tribal member, but you're also working with the tribe uh, because the tribe is the one that has all of the, uh, uh, all of the documents, all the record maps, all of those, all that pertinent information that you really need to have to submit uh, as part of the package. Uh, most surveyors, uh, a lot of surveyors that don't have that experience, uh, they'll go in, they'll they'll listen to whatever the uh, 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 you know the tribal member uh, wants. Uh, they the tribal member says, I want this 100 foot by by uh, 200 foot uh, allotment right here, and this is where I want it, uh, and they'll. And that's where they'll put it. There'll be no research, no nothing, and that's the way they'll uh, they'll submit. Uh, 
Well, people don't realize uh, that uh, you know from the time uh, that uh, they send off that product to uh, uh, to the bills, it's you know it's two or three months before they get to it to start to check. Well, time is money, you know. Uh, so uh, so if the bill's going to take a look at it and say, no, that's not good enough. Need more information. Well, it takes him two or three months to uh, to get that information. He sends it back. There's another three months. So you could talk. Uh, you could really extend it out a lot. So. It's very important that you select the right surveyor, okay? Uh, and what I'm going to do is a little promotion uh, in that you should be developing your own surveyors within our own tribal uh, communities, within our uh, our own reservations. I've been pushing for that for a long time. That is what uh, that is something that we all need. We need to take care of our own land. We care for our land. We know how important our land is. No one else knows how important our land is. So you know. Push your youth, push those who are, uh, you know, who are uh, interested in, in these kind of things. Get them into uh, into these into these positions that will help us, uh, help us as a people, help us as a, uh, you know, uh, as a community. Because we do need that. You, you talk about where do we get these surveyors? Well, if we have our own, there they are. So. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. That's a very important message. Um, developing others is. It's my jam. I really love it. Developing young surveyors really lights me up is a passion. Um, how do we get them? I don't know. I'm still figuring out that part of the recipe. Uh, <laughs> but um, thank you. That was a wonderful message. Know a young person. How do they get started? How does a young person get started in surveying? That's a great question. Uh, how young? Say just coming out of high school. Coming out of high school. Uh, so coming out of high school, um, Chris, pay attention so you can help fill in the gaps for me here, please. Uh, so coming out of high school, somebody who is interested in surveying, uh, I'll tell you my story. Um, and when I started college, I didn't even know that surveying was a profession. Um, I was very lucky to go to a college that had a surveying program. And so uh, one of my friends, said, you know, you're a freshman in college, so you have to pick a major. I'm like, I, I don't even know what that is. Um, I have a, an 18-year-old and a 20-year-old myself. It's so unfortunate that we make our young people decide what they're gonna do with the rest of their lives um, when they're at this 18, 19-year-old age. Uh, so I was in college. They said, you have to pick a major. And so I went through the course catalog book, and I found surveying, and I read through it, and I said, that sounds really interested. I'm, I do OK at math. Um, I, I understand the outdoors is always, uh, always something I really love to go out hiking, always camping. Uh, and so I took a surveying class, fell in love with it. Uh, I was very blessed to get my very first job at 19 years old with the BLM, and they sent me immediately out into the woods, and then um, I always say surveying chose me. I didn't choose surveying. So I guarantee if you have a youth that is uh, interested in serving their community, interested in, uh, does not, is not afraid of math, um, it's, it's, not, it's not intimidating, um, you know, we do a lot of computer work. Uh, we have a lot of tools and technology that helps us. So they don't have to be a whiz at math, but as long as they're not intimidated, it doesn't scare them. Um, and they love to be outdoors. They love to go treasure hunting. They love to dig up and they love to find evidence and to solve puzzles. Um, then surveying is a really good avenue for them. Uh, they can get started on as a technician working uh, for the private crews or um, our Forest Service has surveyors, the BLM has surveyors as well. Um, even our bills, our bills are doing field work. They might need a technician to help them out. Uh, so getting a summer job as a technician is a good way to uh, get your foot in the door to help you decide if this is something that I'm really interested in. And then once you want to pursue it, then uh, surveying is a positive education uh, program which means that uh, you've got to go to college. So uh, there are surveying programs across the nation. Uh, OIT has a really big uh, program in Oregon, um, but there's also surveying colleges across the nation. And I actually attended a presentation recently from New Mexico. I want to say New Mexico State College, but I feel like I might have that wrong. Uh, they have a completely on online surveying degree program. 
um, that you can do virtually from wherever you are. Yeah, Chris, did I miss anything? How does somebody get started in surveying? How do we encourage our youth? I, I was born a surveyor. I was <laughs> surveying before I knew what surveying was. Um, you have to like the outdoors. You have to um, like history because of the research and all of that. I, I mean, I, I was literally a surveyor before I knew what it was and found out in college that, hey, this is exactly what I'd want to do. Um, yeah, we had the question about the colleges. There are a few um, four-year degrees. Yeah, four-year degree very programs. Many. And then there are a couple two-year colleges. But a lot of them are hidden in GIS, with GIS portions of it, which is a very good combination to have that link to having it on the ground, to having it in a digital, which is extremely important. So I think that's it. I see. So it's about oh. four year? So there are two year and four year degrees. There are some colleges that have two year degrees. Um, depends on the state, some state licensing you have to have a four-year degree. There are some states at two-year degree and there are some states that have uh, just education. But most of them, you have to be in the business at least four years. Some of them are six. So it's four years of school and then two years in the field. Um, and it's a rigorous test. There are actually usually three tests. There's the principles and practice and I forget the other one for NCAAS, you have to take both of those and then a state specific. So. A good portion of the programs are designed for working professionals, so somebody who is already working on a crew. Um, and, and honestly, that's a lot, that's a, a very common way for surveyors to be born is that they get a summer job working on a crew, they fall in love with it, they want to make that their career, and so then they go back to college to get their degree. So a lot of the programs are designed for working professionals. Another uh, question? I work for a compact tribe, so we contract out a lot of CFEDs. Do you see a conflict of interest of like us hiring and training our own CFED instead of relying on an outside source? So a land surveyor, it's a tough business because I am working for you and you're paying me to do a job for you, but every piece of property that your um, land adjoins to or contiguous with, I'm surveying theirs too. And any easements or rights to go with that. So I go out to your property and survey it, and all of a sudden your fence is 15 feet on your neighbors, and it's your fence. I have to point that out, I have to draw it out, and I have, you know, your neighbors now know that, hey, you're on encroaching on my property, and I gotta go to you and say, hey, you're wrong, but hey, please pay me, <laughs> you know? So a land surveyor works for everybody that's touching that piece of property and has rights and interest in it. So it shouldn't be a conflict of interest. They should be doing their job. And when you sign and seal a document with your stamp on it, depending on the state, it's mine until I die. If I mess it up and we monument our mistakes because we go out and put a corner there and if we mess it up, they've got a monument right there. I am responsible with that until I die. Some state has 10 years, some states have 15 years. In some states it's a certain amount of time from the point of discovery. So it's, you know, it's not something to be taken easy. So, and you have insurance and stuff for that, but yeah, yeah it, it shouldn't be. A long time to get a surveyor to get our project done because they're gonna do fee land first yep. before they do our tribal one. So if we had a tribal that's in-house with us, yeah. No. Yeah. So I, I worked with a, a gentleman, his dad was a surveyor, he trained all of his sons to be land, professional land surveyors except for one who didn't want to be, he wanted to be a party chief, he just wanted to go out and do the rod and do all that. And he told me, Chris, do you know what LS stands for? Said, no. He says it stands for lawsuit. And the reason why your stamp is in central circles is the bullseye for that lawsuit. So you got to make sure you do your job and do it right. And that's, you know, she talked about the SBE project or um, portion of it, the LDR, the certificate of inspection, all those would be done in a land survey when you're out on the ground 
to make sure you do the job right. And it's not just putting the deed on the ground. I just want to add one little caveat onto the way that the uh, 303 DM7 is written, that all of those products have to be signed by a CFED surveyor. Or uh, BLM surveyor. Or, or a BLM surveyor, yeah. correct. Um, so yeah, so if you have a surveyor perhaps on staff or that you work with often, um, there could be benefit to encouraging them to take go into the training program. And I'll add on to that, I was at a conference uh, oh, a few months ago now um, doing a CFED's continuing education training program. Um, and uh, one person in the audience who was not a CFEDS but a surveyor said, why does this benefit me? Why should I pay extra money to get a certificate um, and I'm probably not even gonna get any work out of it. I'm probably not gonna be contacted by the tribes. I'm probably not gonna get any extra work out of it. So why should I put in the effort? Um, and we had two CFEDS uh, surveyors who stood up and said that for the training program alone, they said, you don't know what you don't know. And they didn't realize how much they didn't know until they took the training program and it had benefited them greatly. Um, so if you have a surveyor that, that you're already working with um, who may be interested in going through the training program, uh, there's great benefit. Any other questions? You guys have been a wonderful audience and tolerated, <laughs> tolerated me after lunch. Um, as I stumbled through my notes, thank you all for your graciousness. Um, thank you for your time, for your attention. Uh, if anyone has any future questions, uh, we'll be right out at the booth for the rest of today and tomorrow. Uh, and wonderful, have a wonderful rest of your day.